Welcome to EPG Patshala, continuing the lessons in culture studies. This is Pramod K. Nair of the Department of English, the University of Hyderabad. In today's lesson, we will be looking at representations. As you know, cultural studies is very interested in the way popular cultural forms like films, popular cultural magazines, whether it's in sports or bodybuilding or celebrity cultures, are all interested in ways of speaking about common cultural practices, common cultural sentiments, common cultural imaginations. What is important here is to understand that culture as an abstract condition of life requires manifestation in some specific forms. The film is a particular form. The comic book is another commonly read, commonly consumed form. Representations are a strategy, a mechanism through which beliefs, identities, ways of thinking are made available in some organized language or linguistic gesture. Do understand that by language we don't necessarily mean here the printed word. By language we can speak of the language of films, the language of sports cultures, the language of music, the language of gestures, art performances like dance. Anything that requires, that is available to us only through a system of representations is said to be available in language. That's the first thing we need to understand. Now, why is it important to study representations? As we will see in the course of this lesson, representations are not only about putting together a name and a face on paper, putting together an image on a screen. Representations do far more, they achieve far more and therefore most often representations in culture studies are about mechanics and mechanisms of power. Who represents whom? In what way? For what purpose? What is the effect of those representations? Why are we offended by representations? Why are we happy about other representations? If you look at the entire range of representation from classical representations in say dance forms or black and white cinema, through to celebrity culture, even pornography, representations on calendars, artworks such as comic books. We are talking about identities being made available to us through a specific act of putting signs together. Representations involves two key components in any language. A sign, as we understand it, is constituted by a signifier and a signified. The signifier is a word, the signified is a concept. So any language requires these two to work together. The problem however is these connections are not always obvious. The first kind of representational mode that culture studies is interested in comes from the semiotician, semiotics is the study of science, Charles Sanders Peirce who argued that there are three primary categories of signs. The commonest example of would be if you look at your cell phones or your printers, a sign which suggests the sub object itself. A printer will be a printer sign. Information will be an I. These are icons. Icons are signs which have some correlation in terms of shape or function to the object they represent. So when we see the symbol of a gradient, a slope, it means the road is shaped this way. When we see the icon of a printer, it means a printer. So the icon is a sign which has some physical or functional similarity with the object it represents. There's another kind of sign. Suppose you see a footprint or you hear a knock upon the door. What does it mean? Now the knock upon the door or a footprint is not connected to anything like that. But something causes the knock upon the door. Something produces the footprint. This is an indexical sign. An indexical sign is connected to its meaning by a cause effect sequence, by a source. A knock upon the door means there is somebody outside who wants to come in. A footprint means somebody had come here and left a footprint. So an index is not connected to the shape of the person, but is connected to something that produces the effect 
of this particular sign. There's a third, far more complicated sign, which is what most of us doing literature and culture studies are interested in, and that's the symbol. When you drive, you stop at the color red. When you want to go to a doctor, you look for a sign of the red cross. What does it mean? Does the red cross in any way represent the practice of medicine? It doesn't. Does the red light say stop in any significance? No, it doesn't. Symbols are signs whose meanings are established by social conventions because we have all accepted that the red light means stop, that the red cross means a medical doctor. Symbols are more complicated signs because they capture sentiments, intellectual activity, the imagination of the people. National symbols are the best example of this particular sign mode. The national symbol, a flag or a national anthem, is in no way connected to the people. It's, does, it's not talking about the lives of the people, the variety of the people, but the people relate to it. Why do the people relate to it? Because they see themselves as somehow connected to this national symbol. So the symbol is something we establish by common agreement. People like Stanley Fish, commentators working in reader response criticism, argue that societies are made up of interpretive communities. We as a community interpret the flag in a particular way, in a particular significance for ourselves. The flag in itself is just a piece of cloth with some colors on it. But if I say to you, why do you have to pay any respect to the national flag? It's after all a piece of cloth. You'll be offended. Why would you be offended? You'd be offended because you say, no, you can't say that. It's a symbol that I connect to. This connection is arbitrary, but established by social acceptable systems of conventions, where we all agree that this is our flag, this represents our country, and this is a sign of our identity. Note, you did not have a role in the designation of the flag. You were not designing it. You are not called upon to comment upon it. And yet, you relate to the sign. In other words, what I'm saying is, you don't create that sign. And yet, any such sign anywhere in the country or in the world you immediately say, that's my country's flag. Why do you say that? Because our identities are captured in the representation called the symbol of the national flag. You must have discovered that what we are heading towards is not signs as linguistic acts. We are looking at representations as political, social and cultural features of our lives. What do we mean by that? What I'm suggesting is, we need to see representations as acts, features, characteristics of a cultural order, of the way we imagine ourselves to be, of the way we think ourselves to be. Representations are political acts. They're culturally relevant acts. They carry meaning. Meaning could be of various kinds. I mean, we may dispute it. We may disagree about it. We might feel moved and sentimental about it. We may hate it. But you cannot live without them. You cannot live in any cultural or social order without adhering to cultural codes, without accepting certain forms of representation. Do understand this could be in music. The national anthem would be about music. It's not about the lyrics alone. It's about the music. It's how we sing it. Uh, it could be about national icons, whether it is Sachin Tendulkar or the Parliament House. It could be flags and colors on the flag, any of these. In other words, representation is about identity and cultural mediation of our sense of belonging, our sense of ourselves. Now, having looked at this, you also need to move beyond the question of representation as linguistic act into something else. Suppose I ask you, how do you know who you are? You will say, we are students of e Patshala. Now, I ask you, what do you mean by we are students of e Patshala? We are enrolled in a program where we read certain lessons which are prepared by certain people in certain areas. Now notice how you are defining yourself. You are not defining yourself as students of particular skin color, 
coming from particular languages, coming from particular regions of India, having read this, that and other. No, you are defining yourself as students of a particular set of courses, students who read those lessons in particular ways. In other words, your identity as students, as children who read a certain subject, is defined by a representation of what a student means. If we don't have a definition of students, you are not students. You are given identity cards. You are given school uniforms when you are at school. Why? The identity card or the uniform is a system of representation that constructs you as a student. Now, this is a little difficult to follow, but let's pace it out quietly and softly. You are a human being. We accept this. All right. But if somebody were to ask you, who are you? You will not say you are a human being. That is visible. That's obvious. You have to say something more. You will say, my name is, I belong to, I speak the following languages. Now, what are you doing here? You are representing yourself through various languages of representation. Those are languages of education, of cultural identity about language, of appearance. This is what I look like. Of affiliation, I belong to this family, this village, this locality, this community. In other words, your reality as a person depends upon the way you represent yourself and the way others represent you. There is no identity beyond this representational process. Now, I am not disputing that you are humans before these representations exist. No. You are humans, we understand that. But in order for you to say you are not like other human beings, you need a language, you need representation. So you say, my name is this, this person's name is something else. I speak this language, that person speaks another language. In order to speak about yourself, therefore, you need an entire range of representational methods. Those representational methods are what we call discourse. Discourse is a method of speaking. It is about a set of social, legal and other forms of speech that bestow upon us our realities. Now, philosophers and others will say, but there is a reality that is not about these ones, which is partially true. Let me explain with an example here. Suppose we say, oh, that was a disaster. What do we mean by that? You see, in order to understand what disaster is, you need to have a definition of disaster. You need to have a framework within which we understand disaster. Unless there is a concept of disaster, we will not understand what has happened. The language, the concept, the idea, the term precedes our understanding of that reality. Without the framework, which is cognitive, perceptual and linguistic, we will not know what has happened. So suppose you say, this exam of mine was a disaster. People will ask you, um, exactly what do you mean it was a disaster? Now, Bhopal 1984 was a disaster, 9-11 was a disaster, but how is your exam a disaster? Then you have to say, no, you see, um, out of the 50% I need to pass, I could not get more than 20%. To me, that's a disaster. So the person will say, but nobody died. Our idea of disaster means some people will die. Some destruction happens. Some people suffer loss. Then you will have to clarify, no, 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 no. I don't mean disaster in that sense. I am saying my loss in the examination, my failure in the examination is a disaster. Now notice what we have done. We have shifted the cultural and social significance of the word a disaster from meaning injury loss, financial disadvantages and death to meaning failure in an exam. Don't you see what we are doing here? We are talking about an entirely new way of conceptualizing disaster. This is representation. This is discourse. Discourse precedes our understanding of reality. Now for philosophers, this is a problem because they say reality precedes language. But the point we are making here, this is essentially why our post-structuralism Cultural studies argues that we are already given an identity 
before we arrive in the world we are in a particular family we have a particular name we have a certain characteristic we have certain social class caste and gender identities into which we fit those are discourses patriarchy is a discourse what we are looking at here is therefore the discursive construction of reality that is usually how culture studies would put it in critical theory terms the discursive construction of reality means very simply all identities all sense of belonging all sense of who we are hinge upon having a discourse into which we can fit let me give you another example suppose you feel not very comfortable you're not you're feeling uneasy do you go to a lawyer or do you go to a doctor you go to a doctor why do you go to a doctor because you feel that oh this arm of mine is hurting and you go to a doctor what do you tell the doctor do you tell the doctor you know i am um, suffering from a moral crisis or do you say i am suffering from bodily pain you will say i am suffering from bodily pain and the doctor looks at you and says okay the problem is you are an evil person would you accept that you would not why because the discourse of medicine is not supposed to talk about good and evil it's supposed to talk about sickness and health disease and cure every discipline every profession every domain has its own discourse so you expect the priest to tell you about good and evil you expect your parents to teach you about good and evil you expect even in these strange days teachers to tell you about good and evil but you don't expect the doctor to tell you about good and evil the doctor will tell you oh your arm hurts because the following problems are existent in your bone or muscle or nerve or whatever the doctor will tell you given these problems i am diagnosing it as this particular medical condition for which the following medicines must be taken now you see the doctor's discourse is rooted in what he thinks is the problem with your body not with your soul or your mind or your heart it's not your emotional status he's measuring unless he, of course he's a psychiatrist but the point i'm trying to make here is the discipline of medical practice has a discourse which says the following parameters define good health if you don't fill and fit those parameters then you are ill if you are ill then the following steps must be undertaken that is the discourse of medicine the parameters of health the parameters of sickness and the solution the therapeutic discourse you have the following conditions you need to adopt the following procedures to get better you don't hear the medical doctor speaking quantum physics or moral science to you why not because that's not his discourse every field has its discourse now the reality of medicine requires this discourse if you have to be convinced by the doctor if the doctor has to make sense to you both sides the patient and the doctor must participate in this discourse what i'm therefore suggesting is for you to understand discourse is what constructs the identity of patient and the doctor they both need to share the same language you cannot go and tell the doctor my arm is hurting because i am an evil person he will say i am not concerned with that i want you to tell me what kind of pain you suffer from and i will offer you the following suggestions and the patient says oh i understand uh, your interest is only in the bodily dysfunction of various organs yes both patient and doctor therefore become patient and doctor only because they have at that point in time the same discourse in operation now you see it is not just their identity but the very reality of the doctor patient interaction that is defined by the discourse they share if that discourse breaks apart for instance your doctor starts making jokes then you say that's not what a serious doctor is supposed to do imagine the fun you would have and the disappointment you might possibly suffer if instead of teaching your teacher starts singing is that the discourse of the classroom no the discourse of the classroom is the teacher comes and says today we'll do the following lessons take out these texts all these textbooks and i will teach you you sit and read and you write your notes or whatever that's the discourse of a classroom where the definition of a teacher 
the definition of a student, even the reality of the classroom is determined by the discourse that is in operation. Now you see the power of representation itself. Without these representations, we will not make sense of who we are. Following from this is a particular problem for cultural studies. Are all representations political? The answer is obvious, yes. Do all representations have cultural significance? The answer is again obvious, yes, of course. So, what if certain representations are wrong? Certain representations are uncomfortable or prejudiced. Let me take the most ex famous example of this kind of representation in the 20th century. Adolf Hitler said, the Jews are a form of life, but they are not human. I quote, Jews are a form of life, but they are not human. Now, when you listen to that, you say there is something wrong about it because Jews are human. Then what's happening here? You see, what Hitler is doing is, Hitler is representing the Jews, that entire community, the race of Jews, as people who are subhuman or non-human. Now you will say, how does it matter? How does it matter what Hitler is calling them? Uh, they know they are human, but Hitler says they are not. That's where the problem rises. It's not that he just uses a term. It's not that he says, oh, let's not look at them, they are not human and, and dismiss them. No. Following upon this representation is the Holocaust. In other words, it is the representation of Jews as non-human that allows the Nazi Germans to do whatever they want. Since they are not human, you can treat them as non-humans. You see the danger here? The danger here is representation constructs reality. It defines, it delimits reality because there is no identity outside language. There is no identity outside representation. When Adolf Hitler, Hitler says very dismissively, very caustically, oh, the Jews are not human. He prepares the ground for doing with them whatever you want. My second example would be from 2004 and Abu Ghraib and what the Americans did in the Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay prisons. You see, if you are arrested as a soldier, you are a prisoner of war and you are entitled to certain rights under the Geneva Conventions, how to treat prisoners. So the Americans who wanted to torture these people said, oh, but they are not prisoners of war, they are enemy combatants. In other words, they represented the Afghani Iraqi people who were arrested in a different way. If you are not prisoners of war, you don't deserve, you are not entitled to Geneva Conventions protection. We can do with you what you want. The torture of the prisoners was made possible because of a shift in representation. Representation, remember, is political. The minute you say they are not prisoners of war, why do you have to protect them and why do you have to follow the conventions outlined by the United Nations? We don't have to. The minute you have done that, you have constructed an entirely different and entirely horrific reality, whether it is of Jews or whether it is of Afghanis and Iraqis arrested in Baghdad. Now you see, this is what we call stereotyping. Stereotyping is the representation of a group of people, ethnic, religious, linguistic, as though they are constant. Stereotyping is the capturing of an entire tribe or group's essence and then saying, this is all they are, as the Americans would say during the war on terror, all terrorists are Muslims. So all Muslims are terrorists. No, all Muslims are not terrorists. But you see, the stereotyping becomes effective because it captures the imagination of the people. It's important to understand what this means. It means representations deny the people the dynamism of change. They capture you, they limit you, and then they can do with you what you want. So, the sexualized portrait of women on Kingfisher calendars and in movies is an essentializing representation. It means there is nothing beyond that. We do not see anything beyond this representation. That becomes the reality of the woman, of the Jew, of the terrified Baghdadi 
man caught and identified as a terrorist. Now you see, this is why the question of discourse and the question of representation is important in cultural studies. When we define people in this way, we limit them. We can do with them what we want because there is nothing beyond it. Their other realities are denied because the stereotype becomes the only reality. To go back to the example I gave you, if you go as a person with a body ache to the doctor, your only reality is to talk about the problems you suffer from medically speaking, not your moral crisis. You can't go and at that point worry about your relationship with your parents or your wife or your children or your husband. That's not his job. That's the psychiatrist's job. At that point, you have to say, I will speak about this. Like the Americans or the Nazi Germans said, we will only speak about the Jews as vermin, as non-human. To limit representation to this kind of stereotyped, fixed, static states is to then refuse them diversity, refuse them a shifting dynamics. It's to refuse them a plural life. Surely you understand why culture studies is interested in this. When we represent these other ethnic groups, races in popular cultural forms like films or um, soap operas or comics, we are sending out a particular message about that group itself. We are not looking at diversity. We are sending out, like I said, a particular message. We present them in one way because we represent them in one way only. Oh, all whites are like this. All blacks are like this. All the Jews are like this. Are there other ways in which Jews lead their lives? Yes, but you see they are not part of the cultural representation. Cultural representations in popular culture become central to our studies in culture studies because they are about power. They are telling us these groups are inferior, these groups are superior. We can beat these people, we can't beat these people. We can arrest some and put them in Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib because they are terrorists, even if they are not. And some people can do whatever they want with them. Why is it important to study representations? Because representations are political. They have political consequences. And ultimately, they describe unequal power relations in any social order. Let me quickly summarize. Representations are important because all identities hinge upon representations. Representations take the form of discourses in various fields, scientific, legal, religious, social discourses. Discourses are ways of speaking. Discourses are ways of representing oneself and the other. These discourses construct our reality, but most importantly, they construct our social relations, how we connect to each other. When these representations become stereotypical, then the dynamism of an individual, the variety of a cultural group is lost. Instead, they are reduced to their essentialized as, either this or that. This also means effectively the rest of the world can treat them based only on the stereotype and ignore the rest. Representations become central to culture studies because the social order runs on representations. And any study of any popular cultural form ultimately will have to look at how particular identities, whether of the working classes or Dalits or women or the blacks, have been represented in popular cultural forms. Without a study of the linguistic, verbal, nonverbal, visual forms of representation, you cannot explic explicate the, the groundwork of social reality.